I'm on a mission to use every single dog Pokemon in a solo run to definitively answer the question, who is Pokemon's top dog? Forget man's best friend, we're looking for trainer's best friend. And where else would we start this journey than with the original puppy Pokemon, Growlithe? Since Generation 1 is best saved for J-Rose, today we'll see if you can beat Pokemon Fire Red with just a Growlithe. Before we get into it, let's see what Growlithe has to offer. In terms of stats, it's pretty decent for a first stage Pokemon. 70 in both attacking stats gives us a decent bit of firepower, and while 60 speed is average, there's only so many fast Pokemon in Kanto, so it should serve us pretty well. And while the defenses do leave a bit to be desired, there isn't one stat that heavily drags us down, so overall, not too bad. Going over our move pool, we're a bit limited on coverage. With only a handful of types at our disposal, some trainers are already looking like quite the uphill battle. Not only that, the only boosting move Growlithe gets is agility, so we won't be able to set up and one-hit everything like some other Pokemon could. But on a more positive note, we have access to several helpful status moves that could prove quite vital later on in the game. And better yet, we're fortunate enough to start off with Bite, which I think is one of the best moves in Fire Red. More on that in a bit. The last thing for Growlithe is its ability. It can have either Flash Fire or Intimidate. I thought about this decision for a while and ultimately decided that Intimidate would be better in the long run. And while I still think this was the right call, there was a brief period where I really regretted this decision. But with all that said, let's get into the run itself. We begin by naming ourselves Shepsky and our rival the worst thing a Growlithe could ever dream of. After the initial dialogue, we receive Growlithe from Professor Oak and give him the best name possible, as our rival chooses Squirtle. As we make our way through some of the initial battles, this is a good time to touch on our starting move, Bite. Red and Blue were made before the Dark and Steel types were added to the franchise, and as Gen 1 remakes, Fire Red and Leaf Green don't have any of these newly introduced Pokemon available during the main game. But what it does have are the changes made to existing moves in Pokemon, such as the Magnemite line now being Electric and Steel. Of all these minor changes, one of them was Bite now being made into a Dark-type move, and Dark coverage in Kanto goes a long way. With only 10 Pokémon in the region that resist Dark, along with it being one of the few types that's actually super effective against Psychic, Bite ends up being a super spammable move in Fire Red, especially since it has a 30% chance to flinch. That's the same chance Body Slam has to Paralyze, Scald has to Burn, and Focus Blast has to miss. So safe to say, it's gonna happen a lot. For the perfect showing of how great a move it is, let's get into our first gym battle against Brock. Since dark moves are all special in Gen 3, Geodude and Onyx's high defenses are completely irrelevant. On Geodude, Bite ends up being an easy two-shot. However, Onyx is the bigger threat to us since it has the move Rock Tomb. And with Bite doing just under half, and Rock Tomb lowering our speed, all it takes is one connecting to bring us under half, allowing Onyx to outspeed, and we're knocked out with another one. However, during our very next fight, Bite comes through with not only one, but two flinches, allowing us to get past Brock completely unscathed. At first glance, this may feel a little too luck-based, but between the chance for a flinch, Rock 2 missing, critical hits, or Onyx using any other move, there's plenty of ways to get through Brock without any extra levels. Moving along, we're able to get past Route 4 and Mount Moon with little trouble, landing us at the crossroad of facing our rival, or Misty. Despite being at a type disadvantage, I decide to give Misty an attempt just to see how close we can get. At level 21, we are just barely able to two-shot star you with what had to be a minimum damage roll followed up with a maximum roll. Regardless, it doesn't really matter because by the time we get to star me, we get outsped and one-shot with Water Pulse. Welp, guess we're gonna fight the rival then. Our rival No Pets leads off with Pidgeotto as I start whittling him down with Bite. While it does take 3 hits to knock it out, thanks to Intimidate, we don't end up taking a ton of damage from him before he goes down. Next in is his Squirtle. Bite looks to be about a 3 hit KO, as our first one ends up getting the flinch. After our second bite, we get hit with a water gun that does quite a good chunk of HP. And while Squirtle ends up living the third bite, another flinch allows us to get past it. Like I said, flinches are gonna happen... a lot. Not against Abra though, as Bite simply one-shots it. Last in is his Rattata, and while Quick Attack gets us into the red, we're just barely able to knock it out and defeat our rival on the very first attempt. This is going to be one of the many instances where Intimidate really came in clutch for us, as without it, Pidgeotto would have done more damage, and those last Quick Attacks from Rattata could have knocked us out. But for now, we head over to Bill's house and help him with his hyper-realistic cosplay experiment, and leave with an SS ticket in hand. At this point, we're level 25, so I decide to try the Misty fight again. 
We end up getting by Staryu without any trouble, but even though we're 4 levels higher than Starmie, we still get outsped and hit with Water Pulse. On the bright side, not only do we live the hit, Bite ends up doing over just half its health. At this point, all we need to win is to outspeed Starmie and we should be in the clear. After fighting all the trainers surrounding Vermilion City, including one who was using a very good boy, we come back at level 30. As per usual, Staryu goes down without much trouble. And this time, we finally end up outspeeding Starmie, and while it lives the bite, we also live Water Pulse. And even though she heals it up, we're doing enough damage to the point where we end up getting a KO on the following turn. While I knew Misty was going to be a little difficult, I'm kind of surprised Growlithe is already at level 30. Especially since these levels seem necessary for fighting the rival on the SSN. Pidgeotto is out first, and thankfully our bite ends up flinching, allowing for an easy 2 hit KO. And better yet, when Wartortle comes out, Bite flinches again. Unfortunately, our good luck turns bad as Wartortle lives the next Bite in Torrent range and one-shots us with a critical hit water gun. Sick. On our second attempt, we get the same flinch luck against Pidgeotto, although it lands a quick attack before going down, leaving us with a nice amount of HP. As Wartortle comes out, we go for a Bite as he thankfully goes for Withdraw. After our next Bite, we get hit with a water gun, bringing us just under half. Thankfully on the next turn we're able to knock it out and move on to his Raticate. Despite our level advantage, Raticate survives as we're brought down to 20 HP. Luckily we're able to get through the rest of this fight without taking any more damage, but we easily could have lost this fight if Wartortle used Water Gun instead of Withdraw. But with the rival defeated, we rub an old man's back, get the HM for cut, and head off to the Vermilion Gym. We get through the gym puzzle itself in near record time, because I'm a pro, and we jump straight into the battle against Lieutenant Surge. By this point we're level 33 and we've learned our new strongest attack, Flame Wheel. With this new move and our level advantage, we're able to get past both Voltorb and Pikachu without much issue. When we get to Raichu, our Flame Wheel ends up doing just under half as we unfortunately get paralyzed from static. Thankfully, Raichu ends up going for Thunder Wave so no harm was done. He then goes for Double Team, at which point you can probably hear my eyes rolling as I miss my next Flame Wheel. And while we do get fully paralyzed on the next turn, we're luckily able to both break through paralysis and land a hit on Raichu on the following turn, securing the victory. At this point in the game, we're pretty high in levels, so I try and dodge trainers throughout the next couple routes. Keyword, try. As most Pokemon players would, I force my way through Rock Tunnel based on nothing but my memory, and we eventually make it to Lavender Town to face our rival, No Pets. What a stupid name. At this point, Growlithe is level 37, because again, Keyword, try, and overall the battle goes pretty smoothly. Pidgeotto goes down easily as usual, and we get an important flinch against Wartortle that allows us to knock it out without too much trouble. Even though we're over 10 levels higher, Wartortle is proving to be a consistent threat during the rival fights, which only worries me more for when it becomes a Blastoise. Like I said, the rest of the battle is pretty smooth, giving us our last easy win against our rival. From here I decide to give our good boy some R&R &R by letting him play with some of his cousins in the wild before heading over to the Celadon Gym to fight Erika. As you could expect, this fight went off without a hitch. Next up is the Rocket Hideout. We take some time and have some fun on the spinny things, pick up the black glasses to boost the power of Bite, and head into our first fight with Giovanni. Both his Onyx and Rhyhorn are pretty easy to deal with by spamming Bite, and after getting past them we find ourselves against Kangaskhan. As we go for Flame Wheel, I'm met with a hard truth. Starting to face fully evolved Pokemon, and even with our high level, we're not doing a ton of damage. Luckily, we are able to get through Kangaskhan thanks to its poor move choice, but it's at this point I'm really starting to think about strategies outside of use strongest move. This issue is even more pressing after we use the Poke Flute against Snorlax. We're 15 levels above it, and this battle took way longer than it should have. Granted, part of that is because Snorlax has Yawn and Rest, but the point still stands when we're face to face with a Pokemon that has good stats. It's gonna be rough. <laughs> Get it? Rough? From here, we make it to Fuchsia City and make an attempt at beating Koga. We start this battle at level 47 as Koga starts off with coughing. Because of its low special defense, one Flame Wheel is enough to knock it out. Then he sends in Muck, and Flame Wheel does... not a lot. Even worse, he goes for Minimize. Oh boy. Worse double team. And as if that wasn't enough, on the next turn he uses Toxic. While I try to push through this obnoxious combo, when Koga uses a Hyper Potion, it's pretty clear we're gonna have to give this another attempt. On the next go around, once I get to Muck, I go for Takedown since it has lower defense, and I end up doing a little bit more damage. But unfortunately, the cycle of Minimize and Toxic starts again, at which point I'm slowly whittled down until getting knocked out with a Sludge. 
Instead of trying this fight again and again and crossing my fingers that I get the luck I need, I decide to train up to level 49, that way I can learn Flamethrower, our strongest and most reliable attack for the rest of the game. With this newly acquired firepower, I give Koga another attempt. This time when we make it to Muk, Flamethrower does just about half as he goes for Minimize. Thankfully luck is on our side, as we not only land the next Flamethrower, but we do enough damage to put that monster behind us. Koga's next coughing is a joke, as it leaves as swiftly as it came in. And at this point, he sends in his final Pokemon, Weezing. He ends up surviving Flamethrower and gets burned as a result, before landing a Toxic. While I'm thinking the battle is over, Koga then tries to stall me out using Hyper Potions, like an honorable gym leader would. But eventually, we're able to land a critical hit and win the match. However, this is no time to celebrate, as we have a really tough battle lying ahead. So we make our way over to Saffron City, head into the Sylph Company, and attempt the fight against Rival Fievel. We start this battle at level 51 as our rival sends out Pidgeot. I go for agility, not realizing I was already faster, as Pidgeot uses Wing Attack. Luckily, our flamethrower next turn ends up landing a critical hit as we knock out Pidgeot, sending in his Blastoise. While he stalls the first turn by going for Protect, we go for Bite afterwards and do very little damage, as Water Gun does a ton to us. While flinches definitely help us out, we're just not doing enough damage fast enough before getting taken out ourselves. Even on our following attempt, where we get really good luck with Blastoise going for double protects, it still isn't enough to get us through. And that's to say nothing of the three Pokemon he has after Blastoise. So at this point, there's two options. I can either level up until I do enough damage, or I can start implementing some actual strategy. Those options considered, it's time for my first secret weapon of the run. Substitute. Back in Fuchsia City, there's an NPC who will teach a single Pokemon Substitute, and thankfully Growlithe can learn it. With this one simple change, let's see how our next fight goes against Rival Fievel. As we start the fight, I want to bring your attention back to Intimidate. Lowering Pidgeot's attack ensures that we're able to use Substitute and keep it in play by the time we get to Blastoise. That being said, I make a bad judgement call and have to use another Substitute, leaving me at about half health by the time Blastoise hits the field. Our first bite ends up flinching, shout out to that 30%, as Blastoise follows up with a Protect. But he doesn't stop there, as he uses Protect four more times, for some reason. Hey, sometimes you just catch a break. Unfortunately, right before we knock him out, our rival comes to his senses and breaks our sub with Water Gun. But at this point, it's too late, and since the rival doesn't heal, we're able to knock out Blastoise. Next in is his own Growlithe, which we get some much appreciated flinch luck on. Next in is Execute, which is an easy knockout with Flamethrower, which brings us to his last Pokemon, Alakazam. I go for Bite, but I just barely miss out on the KO. But luckily, since Alakazam goes for Calm Mind, one more Bite is able to finish up the match against Rival Fievel. So it's pretty obvious that a lot of things went in our favor during the match, but without Substitute on the moveset, none of it would have been possible. And this is only the first of many instances of which Substitute saves this run. From here we move on and have our second fight with Giovanni. Overall, he doesn't prove to be too difficult. For one, we get really good luck against his Nidorino and Rhyhorn in the form of a crit and a flinch, but these two aren't really a threat anyways. Nidorino can't deal enough damage to break a substitute, and Rhyhorn doesn't have the greatest moveset either. Thankfully, his next Pokemon Kangaskhan goes down pretty easily as well, which sends in his final Pokemon, Nidoqueen. While we are able to come out of this battle with a win, it's worth noting that Flamethrower was a 3-hit KO, despite having an 11 level advantage. It's little things like this that get me more and more worried for the looming threat of the Elite Four. But before we get there, we now have to face Sabrina. And thankfully, this is one of those times where Sabrina turns out to be really easy. I don't know if y'all relate to this, but Sabrina is such a weird gym leader in these games. She's only ever really difficult or a cakewalk. This time, we'll count ourselves lucky it was the latter. At this point, there's just two gym leaders remaining, so from here we head over to Cinnabar Island, and after a quick jaunt through the Pokemon Mansion, we find ourselves up against Blaine. So, remember when I said there was a brief period where I regretted going Intimidate over Flashfire? Well, here we are. The first issue we face is that every member of Blaine's team has Fire Blast, which does a good chunk of damage, even if it's used by Growlithe or Ponyta. Even with substitute strategies, we have to re-up it multiple times, and when we eventually get to Rapidash, our HP is pretty low. Speaking of Rapidash, it's a 3-hit KO, and Bite usually brings it to the point where Blaine uses a Hyper Potion, of which he has two. And as if all that wasn't enough, Blaine never misses Fire Blast. Seriously, in all of my attempts, he didn't miss once. 85% my ass. After several attempts and gaining another level, I get a run where I knock his Growlithe into the red and flinch it, as he ends up healing it in the next turn. 
I go for Flamethrower a couple times to knock it out, getting me to Ponyta with zero damage. I go for Bite and get another lucky flinch, and follow it up the next turn with a substitute. As always, Blaine lands his Fire Blast, but since it's a fresh substitute, it doesn't knock it out. This means I get to Rapidash with as high of HP as possible while I'm still in a sub. And while the sub does get taken out, I end up getting a really well-timed flinch as Blaine heals it up. Thankfully, since he healed Growlithe earlier, we don't have to worry about any more potions after this. While we do end up getting hit with a powerful Fire Blast, we are able to knock out Rapidash for the first time with just 64 HP left. Now it's time for Arcanine. I go for Bite, and while it does some decent damage, he ends up landing a takedown which I just barely survive. We go for our favorite 30% chance, and luckily it pays off as we flinch Arcanine, allowing us to take it down the next turn. Now, before you criticize my luck, again, Blaine never missed an attack throughout all of our fights. He landed 17 out of 17 fire blasts, not to mention two fire spins and one takedown. On average, he should have missed at least three of those. But regardless, what's done is done, and we set our sights on our final Giovanni battle. At this point, we're almost level 60, so I decide to give this battle a go with full offense. First off, Rhyhorn falls to a single bite. Next in is Doug Trio, which, to my surprise, we actually outspeed, and then we Oko it with a flamethrower. I don't know about you, but I've been very impressed with our speed tier throughout the game. Nido Queen comes in next, and while we do over half with Flamethrower, we take big damage from an Earthquake. Even though we can knock it out the next turn, Giovanni's next Pokemon is Nido King, and we're just a bit shy of knocking it out with Flamethrower, as Earthquake easily wipes us out. I decide to give this battle another go with Substitute in the mix, but we end up in pretty much the same position where we just need to do a little bit more damage. While I could level up, or even teach Growlithe Fire Blast through TM, I actually chose to head back to the game corner in Celadon City. Up until this point, our good boy has been holding the black glasses from the Rocket Hideout, and in the game corner prize area, you can buy a charcoal for only a thousand coins. Like I said earlier, we just need to do a little bit more damage, and the added boost from charcoal might be enough. And well, as it turns out, the key word was might, as we would actually need the charcoal and one extra level to make the difference. At level 60, we start our next fight against Giovanni with a substitute. Rhyhorn ends up going for Scary Face, which allows us to knock it out on the following turn, sub fully intact. As we already found out, we outspeak Doug Trio, so there's no issue there. Then Nido Queen comes in, and we get a really well-timed crit, which, given how much damage we did before, definitely mattered. And as I mentioned, even with the charcoal, we still needed to be level 60 to knock out Nido King with one flamethrower. And even that was a range. But since we were able to get that range, we're left with Giovanni's last Pokemon, Rhyhorn. Really dude, not even a Rhydon? We go for Bite, and while we don't knock it out, the substitute we were able to keep up took the hit from Rhyhorn's Earthquake. And at this point, it's too late for Giovanni, and we're able to finish the fight on the very next turn. I'm pretty sure Rhyhorn would have knocked us out with that Earthquake, so once again, Substitute shows itself as an MVP of the moveset. So with all that done, we've received all 8 badges, with only a good boy on our team. <laughs> and, and some HM users. Our next hurdle is the penultimate rival battle. I head into this fight at level 60, almost positive it's not going to be enough, but I just want to see how well we can do on a first go. As always, Pidgeot comes out first. I decide to go straight for Substitute, and thankfully it holds up after a wing attack. However, we don't deal enough damage with Flamethrower to knock it out before it breaks our Substitute, and we definitely need a sub up by the time the bird goes down. So even though we're able to get past Pidgeot, we're already down to hefty chunk of HP when he sends in Rhyhorn. Unfortunately, we don't knock it out with a single bite, and he actually lands a critical hit takedown, breaking our sub. I try using it one more time to see if I can get a lucky takedown miss, but I end up knocking out Rhyhorn with bite, leaving me with just 1 HP. While this fight is obviously going to be a loss, he luckily sends in Blastoise, meaning we can get a gauge of how well we fare against his biggest threat. I go for bite, and wow, that's um, really not a lot. I try this fight a couple more times, but even at level 63, it's clear I'm just not doing enough damage. And given how difficult the Elite Four is going to be, my best and really only option is to level up. I embark on the Sevi Island side quest in order to level up Growlithe as much as I can. For those of you that don't remember, the Sevi Island side quest basically boils down to rescuing a lost girl from a Hypno that kidnapped her. You know, Pokemon stuff. After leveling up a bit, I come back at level 66, but still no dice. I go again at level 67, but even with a bit of luck from Blastoise going for Rain Dance, we still can't get past it. Even at a really nice level, I still had trouble. I even swapped out Charcoal for Black Glasses to do more damage with Bite, but it's just not enough. And as it turns out, spamming Bite was actually part of the problem. 
In Gen 3, if you compare a resisted flamethrower versus a neutral bite from a fire type, flamethrower ends up doing more because of the same type attack bonus. And with charcoal on top of that, I realized I needed to wean off my crutch of flinching the opponent. I try the battle again, this time with charcoal equipped. I start with substitute versus Pidgeot as its wing attack doesn't break the sub. And this time, with the extra power from charcoal, Pidgeot gets one shot with flamethrower. Not only this, but when Rhyhorn comes out, it also gets one shot with flamethrower, despite being a resisted hit. This lands us in front of Blastoise in the best position we could hope for. I go for Flamethrower, and while I don't do a ton of damage, he uses Rain Dance, which means now it's beneficial for us to use Bite. Man, runs like this are great because a move like Rain Dance genuinely comes into play. While my substitute does get knocked out, I get the best possible flinch luck otherwise, which allows me to knock out his Blastoise for the first time. Next up is his Growlithe, as I take this opportunity to set up another sub as he goes for Agility. Even though we just barely miss out on the KO, his Growlithe is so focused on setting up agility that by the time he actually goes for an attack, being takedown, he knocks himself out with recoil, and still doesn't even break the substitute. Then comes in Execute, and by this time the Rain Dance has worn off, so Flamethrower is an easy one-shot. Lastly, he brings in Alakazam. To my surprise, we not only outspeed, but we also wiped out his Alakazam in one hit, winning us the match. Overall, most of our rival's Pokémon aren't too big of a deal, but Blastoise carries the difficulty for damn near all of them. Regardless, it's time to shelve our worries about the rival for now, and start looking towards the Pokemon League itself. Also, if you're still watching, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. My dog and I would both appreciate it. As for the Elite Four, Lorelei is not only our first hurdle, but potentially the most challenging. Breaking down our team, first is Dugong, which not only knows Surf, but also has the ability Thick Fat, meaning our fire moves do less damage. She also has a Slowbro with Surf and Yawn, as well as Lapras with Surf and Confuse Ray, plus Body Slam to potentially paralyze. Cloyster and Jinx are looking like the weak links of the team, but there's already so much here for us to overcome. And that's just Lorelei. There are still four more fights after her, of which Lance is really scaring me, but to even think about him, we have to get past her. Once we get to the Pokemon League, I decide to jump straight in at level 71 just to see where we stand. And the answer is... not good. Not only do we deal less than half to Dugong with Flamethrower, but Surf deals way too much damage. Knowing this won't work at all, I decide to use the 6 rare candies I have and try again at level 77. And the results are pretty much the same. While I do more damage to Dugong, it doesn't amount to anything significant. I even try using Sunny Day to do more damage with Flamethrower, but for one, it's still not enough, and two, she can use Hail and get rid of it anyways. I even end up with a really lucky attempt where Flamethrower not only is a 3 hit KO, but Dugong uses Safeguard the first turn and Hail the second turn. After I knock it out with a third Flamethrower, Cloyster comes in. To my relief, it goes down with a single Flamethrower since Cloyster's special defense is worse than mine. However, things go bad pretty quickly as Lorelei sends in Lapras. We do just over half health to Lapras and it ends up going for a Confuse Ray. Even though we break through Confusion, thanks to its Citrus Berry healing just enough HP, our next Flamethrower misses out on the KO. And despite having a lot of HP, a single Surf completely wipes us out. So even in some of the more lucky scenarios, we're just not doing enough damage. At this point, I decide to channel the power of Blaine, and I teach our good boy Fire Blast. With our new move, I give it another go, and we get really lucky off the bat, with Fire Blast not only getting a burn, but Dugon goes for Hail instead of Surf. And because of the slight amount of burn damage, our next Fire Blast is able to knock her out. Next in is Cloyster again, and we make the pro prediction on her Protect and set up a Substitute. Then all it takes is Flamethrower, and we're on to Lapras. With Father Blaine on our side, Fire Blast connects and does tons of damage as Lapras breaks our sub with a Surf. Thankfully, even after her Citrus Berry, Fire Blast did just enough damage for Flamethrower to knock her out on the following turn. Then for the first time, we're up against Slowbro. I try to get off a substitute, but she goes straight for Surf, wiping it out. At this point, there's only one thing I really can do. Please flinch, 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 woo! At this point, one more bite nets us a KO, and all that's left is her Jinx, which is an easy one-shot with Flamethrower. Not only am I relieved to finally beat Lorelei, but thankfully our next couple fights are looking to be much easier. The first of which is Bruno. He leads off with an Onyx, which is the perfect opportunity to set up a substitute. Even though he uses a super effective stab rock tomb, thanks in part to Intimidate, he doesn't even break the sub. After the sad rock snake goes down, Hitmonchan comes in. While it does live a flamethrower, it also gets burned, which takes it out at the end of the turn, but not before it takes out our substitute. Next up is his Ace Machamp, and I go for another sub as he luckily uses bulk up. 
and at this point, all we do the rest of the battle is spam fire attacks. Our substitute takes Machamp's Rock Tomb as he goes down to Tomb Flamethrowers, then his Onyx comes in and dies to a Fire Blast, and the same ends up happening for his Hitmonlee. Overall, not too bad. I mean, it's Bruno, so he's never difficult, but even with a fire type, we got through without much trouble. And thankfully, I can say the same for Agatha. She leads off with Gengar, which is a pretty easy target to set up Substitute against, as she uses Double Team. Fortunately, we not only land our Flamethrower, but it ends up burning Gengar, meaning we don't need to worry about landing a follow-up attack. And yet again, thanks in part to Intimidate, its attack doesn't break our sub. Next in is her Golbat, which ends up surviving a Flamethrower and taking out the sub with an Air Cutter. Thankfully, we can use the Elite Four's cheap tactics to our advantage, and I'm able to set up another one as she ends up healing Golbat. Not wanting to take the chance on the damage roll, I click Fire Blast and knock out Golbat in one hit. And then we use the same strategy for her next Pokemon, Arbok. You know, I'm starting to think Blaine's version of Fire Blast is 100% accurate. We haven't missed one either. At this point, her last two Pokemon are Gengar and Haunter, and while her Gengar gets the chance to break our sub, it goes for Hypnosis, sealing the rest of the battle. And you know, while it's nice to have such an easy time against Agatha, and Bruno for that matter, nothing could really prepare me for what was up next. Even more so than Lorelei, Lance is a brutally tough trainer. Lance's team consists of Gyarados, Aerodactyl, two Dragonair, and a Dragonite. For one, every single one of them resists fire. Not only that, every single one of them has Hyper Beam. But more pressing than either of these details, we can barely get past his Gyarados. Even though there are some things going in our favor, like his Dragon Rage not breaking our sub, or the fact that Hyper Beam requires a recharge turn after use, his special defense is so high that we end up having to go through multiple substitutes just to get past him. Like I said, if we don't have a sub up, then we're at risk of getting wiped by Hyper Beam. Even in the instances where we get good enough luck to get past Gyarados, his next Pokemon Aerodactyl completely stops us in our tracks. I tried this fight numerous times, but I could never even get past Aerodactyl. It's at this point I was feeling very stuck, and I realized I had to confront something that had been looming in the back of my head for quite some time. Leftovers. Some of you may have been wondering ever since I started using Substitute, why haven't you given Growlithe leftovers? To obtain the leftovers in Fire Red and Leaf Green, you have to use the item finder on the spot where you knocked out Snorlax right after battle. To get the item finder, you have to show one of Oak's aides your Pokedex with 30 Pokemon registered. Now, in one way, you can argue that this isn't a true solo run if I catch all these Pokemon and obtain the leftovers. But on the flip side, I needed to catch Pokemon for HMs anyways, so it's already not a true solo run. To me, it felt like an easy decision. But if you're upset that I went this route and got the leftovers, then here's a few pictures of my dog as an apology. Hopefully this makes you feel better. With our newly acquired lefties, we make our way back to the Pokemon League and have our rematch with our favorite gal, Lorelei. After a few matches that didn't go quite so well, we end up getting a match where we start off with Bite landing a critical hit. As you can see, I have clearly fallen back on hoping for flinches. I'm weak, I'm sorry. While she does land a Surf, since we're at level 80, we live it quite nicely. Next turn, we land a Fire Blast to knock out Dugong. Next in is Cloyster, which means we try to get up another substitute. Fortunately, he goes for Spikes, allowing us to knock him out with a Flamethrower the very next turn. Lapras is sent next, and we channel our inner Blaine as always to land both of our Fire Blasts, knocking it out. Although, not without harm, as our sub is taken out in the process by Surf. And then just like before, we find ourselves up against Slowbro, relying on a 30% chance to flinch. And as usual, Bite comes through for us. Lorelei is left with just Jinx, which is an easy one-shot with Flamethrower, giving us the win. Facing Bruno again, I decide to swap out our leftovers for the charcoal as last time there were several ranges that ended up needing that extra damage. And well, with Onyx missing Rock Tomb as we set up a substitute, the rest of this battle is a fire festival. In fact, we almost make it through the whole battle without our substitute being knocked out. Yeah, as a whole, Bruno just really isn't a threat to most special attackers. But hey, with both Lorelei and Lance as hurdles, we deserve the break. And this break continues with Agatha. Even though she ends up spamming Double Team at the start of battle, we're eventually lucky enough to land a Flamethrower, knocking her out in one hit. And from this point on, it's just like the Bruno fight. Our sub gets taken out by Arbok, but from then on, everything gets knocked out in one hit. And I just want to point out that with her movesets of Hypnosis, Confuse Ray, Toxic, and Curse, yet again, Substitute really comes through as the MVP. Without it, this fight could have had so many things go wrong. But now that Hagatha is done with, we find ourselves once again facing off against Lance. But this time, we not only have leftovers, we have a revamped moveset. Before, we had been using Substitute, Bite, 
Flamethrower, and Fire Blast. We still kept the first two, but traded out both fire moves for Toxic and Protect. Now, while you may want to roll your eyes at this move set, it did not give me an automatic win. Not by a long shot, actually. For one, Gyarados still took some careful maneuvering, as there was no guarantee I would get past it with a substitute up. Not only that, if knocked into healing range, you'd have to start the toxic process over again since Lance uses full restores, not hyper potions. This took many attempts. At one point, I even considered going back to level up even more. But eventually, I was able to get a match where I got past Gyarados, albeit outside of a substitute. As Aerodactyl came in, I crossed my fingers and went for sub, as he went for scary face. Better yet, I'm able to land a toxic, as he again goes for a scary face. Not only does this allow us to get past Aerodactyl, but we do so in a substitute with full HP by the time we face Dragonite. This is literally as perfect as can possibly be. We're able to land a Toxic as he then goes for Safeguard. Shout out to Growlithe for outspeeding things. The next several turns are a complex balance of staying healthy with Protect, using Substitute to keep us safe, and trying to prevent Lance from using a full restore. Again, by this point Safeguard is up, so we wouldn't be able to Toxic it again until it wore off. After several turns of Outrage, Protect, Bite, and Substitute, we eventually knock out Dragonite. While we don't have a ton of health, we stalled out enough turns to where Safeguard wore off. Last up are his two Dragonair, who both have Shed Skin, so Toxic isn't looking like the best strategy. Instead, we're going with Old Reliable. Not knowing if his first Dragonair is the one with Thunder Wave, I go straight for a Substitute, and thankfully Dragonair sets up another Safeguard. Our bite ends up landing a critical hit, and while Dragonair does break through our sub, we're able to knock it out the next turn, leaving us with just one Dragonair left. I go for Protect, which allows me to find out that this is the Dragonair with Thunder Wave. Thanks to Lance's greed of trying to paralyze me, we're able to safely set up a substitute the next turn. And from here, with careful move choice for the next several turns, we're eventually able to knock out his final Dragonair, finally allowing us to defeat Lance. I think it's safe to say that of every trainer I fought, Lance was easily the most difficult. Before we start our final fight, I have to bid a fond farewell to a good friend, Bite. As amazing as it's been throughout our journey, based on our rival's team, it's more important for us to have Flamethrower again, as well as Substitute, Toxic, and Protect. So farewell, old friend. You've served us well. Take a nice long rest. Jumping into our final rival battle, as always, he starts off with Pidgeot. We're able to get up a substitute as he stupidly uses Sand Attack not once, but twice. Once Pidgeot is in the red zone, he uses a full restore, which I want to make note of. He has full restores. After healing up, he actually swaps out to Rhydon, which is very helpful as I land a flamethrower that does just about half. The reason I emphasize just about is because our next flamethrower misses out on the KO and our sub gets destroyed with an earthquake. However, even though he used a full restore on Pidgeot, he doesn't on Rhydon, so we knock it out. Next in is Blastoise, and while it's definitely a big threat, I have some really good news. Looking at his moveset, the only water move he has is Hydro Pump. Since it has limited PP, we're actually able to slowly but surely stall out every single Hydro Pump with a combination of Substitute and Protect, and all that time he's being slowly whittled down by Toxic. And as Blastoise gets really low on HP, our rival again makes a really weird call and doesn't heal his Blastoise even though he's in prime healing range. I don't know why the rival is inconsistent with healing, but I'm not one to look a gift Mud's tail in the mouth. With all these strange calls from the rival, Blastoise goes down with near perfect circumstances with us behind a substitute at high HP. He brings Pidgeot back out, but since it's already low on HP from him swapping out earlier, it's an easy KO. Next on the field is his Alakazam, which takes a flamethrower pretty well and uses Future Sight. From here, our rival continues his weird judgment calls and heals Alakazam. Not just once, but twice in a row. Really? Thankfully, since we're behind a sub while he's healing, the Alakazam's Future Sight fails and we end up knocking it out the following turn. Second to last is Exeggutor, and like every other time before it, it's an easy KO for us with Flamethrower, meaning we find ourselves facing the final Pokemon of our challenge, Arcanine. How fitting. 
It's a long drawn out battle, but our good boy stares down Arcanine with determination, and after whittling him down with Toxic and surviving a barrage of extreme speeds, Arcanine eventually succumbs to our flamethrowers and Toxic damage, and we finally beat Pokemon Fire Red with just one Growlithe. I knew the Elite Four would be difficult, but I never could have guessed the level of nuance and strategy that it would require. Overall, Growlithe really impressed me. Not only was its firepower substantial throughout the game, but I wouldn't have initially guessed that Toxic and Substitute would be the strategy to get us through. Or I guess I should say, I never thought Toxic and Substitute would be a viable strategy for him without a healing move like Morning Sun. At the very beginning of this video, I said my goal was to find Pokemon's top dog. Is this the best way to do that? Hell no! But will it be entertaining? Well, uh, I hope so. I mean, you've watched this far, so that bodes well. But regardless, we have a long list of pups to get through, so I better get working on the next one. Thank you so much for watching, and be sure to check out some of my other videos. And as thanks for making it to the end of this lengthy video, here's a picture of my dog. Talk to y'all soon.